Welcome back to Truth Talk. I'm loving this. I love talking about the truth. And I love talking about where science is not an enemy to the Bible. In fact, the more you get into the scriptures, the more you realize that they're actually validated by science. So you maybe have come into a polemic argument against Christianity or against the scriptures. Maybe your professor has told you that science and religion are enemies and they don't get along. Well, this is not only woefully um, naive at best and sinister and ominous at worst. It is a blatant lie. And what you will find is throughout the text, there are beautiful Ways And let me just say this, the King James Version, I know, I know, I, I read the NASB, I read um, the original, I work through the, you know, the exegetical original Greek and Hebrew, I try to get a grasp on the original language, but I'm going to tell you something, the King James Version is beautifully eloquent, and, and, and you may you may want a different version. I've said this before on the podcast. You may desire a different version because it's more accurate or you you find it to be more uh, word for word. And I appreciate that. I study often out of an NASB and I preach out of a King James Version. But you are never going to find a more poetic and more wonderfully Uh, translated scripture than the King James Version. And let me just say this, that if you went to Yale or Harvard and you walked into your professor and you told them, I want a new international version of Shakespeare, they would toss you straight out on your head. And they would look at you as if you was some bizarre um, intellectual barbarian. Now, why do I say this? Because the King James Version presents some things in some of the most beautiful ways, and I enjoy it. I thoroughly enjoy it, and I love the way that it, it renders the translation. I don't, I don't think it's the approved God-given version above all other versions. I'm just telling you, it is the poetic version that is the most quotable. Let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 9, that was my introductory rant, okay? So my introduction has an, a rant to it. Let's look at Proverbs nine seventeen. Stolen waters are sweet, okay? What's he talking about? Well, chapter 9, he's talking about the harlot. He's talking about a, a woman who doesn't have virtue to her, and He's talking about what arouses somebody. And he's talking about um, why that there is an element of arousal, an element of seduction within the sexual sins of the Bible. And he mentions this, and this is a fascinating concept. Stolen waters are sweet. Now, what he's saying is not that stolen waters, are ta- they taste better um, to, to you. And there's a scientific proof that you steal something. It's better tasting. What he's alluding to is that part of the heightened sense of anticipation, emotion, and arousal is not really in the act. It's not in, um, it's not in the relationship even it's in the fact that there is a heightened sense of risk around it. And And it becomes sweeter to the taste, to the psychological and intellectual taste, because not only is the physical stimulated, but the intellectual is stimulated as well. And so he's letting any young person who who is dealing with temptation and dealing with um, the the, uh, temptation to fall into 
a, a, an affair with a, a, the one of the opposite sex, whether it be fornication or whether it be adultery, he's warning you that it's not that the water's any better, but that there is a sense of it that makes it so attractive. And so, you know, you don't really have a way to explain this to your young people in your church, but part of the attraction, the intense binding of something, and this is an important factor for anybody who is considering marriage or anybody who is considering being with someone for the rest of their life, there is a certain sweetness to it just based on the newness of it. There's a quality of that. But also, if it's something stolen, there's a, a, another emotion around it. And it makes it seem much more intensely gratifying than what the right thing would be. So, uh, the, the wise man, the Proverbs of Solomon says that there is this sexual um, interaction that you're going to have with the opposite sex. But beware that you are not just falling prey to a subset of, of complementary emotions that would not be there if you had legal access to something, okay? So if, if you were to marry that person, um, would, would, he, would you be just as attracted to them or are you attracted because there's this certain illicitness about it or forbiddenness, right? The forbidden fruit concept all the way back to the book of Genesis. And the woman in Genesis 3 and 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and to de desire to make one wise, she took the fruit and did eat, okay? And so when she saw it, it was part of the whole thing that made her want it so bad was the fact that it was forbidden. And this is true with fornication. And so people say, well, you know, God is a prude and God doesn't want me to have sexual freedom or sexual license to enjoy myself and enjoy and express uh, and explore my sexuality. Well, the, the part of it is, is you have to be careful and make sure that what you're attracted to is because that in and of itself is an attractiveness and not just something that stems out of a rebellion against what is forbidden. And this is interesting because if, if you're new to, to Christianity, it, it may come as a great shock to you when you hear a preacher say that marriage is defined in the Bible by Jesus as one man and one woman, and they shall be made one flesh. And so people are like, wow, I, I, I didn't realize that God had a, a view on what I should or shouldn't do. Well, then you begin to read the scriptures and find out that God very much does have a view of what you should and should not do, who you should or should not be married to, who you should or should not sleep with. Once that is introduced as a concept there is a arousal that happens, a stimulant that happens intellectually, not physically, intellectually. And if one dwells on that, one begins to see that the forbidden has a component of attractiveness in it. Now, I, I want to I explain to you an experiment that was done by a Canadian psychologist, actually two of them, um, Donald Dutton and Arthur Aaron, but Donald Dutton uh, is, is toying around with this idea that what if my emotions weren't just singularly based on my attractants? What if other contributing factors came into play? Okay. Um, and so the study is often cited in psychology literature, particularly in discussions of emotional arousal and its effects on attraction. 
Now, what it's toying with is something called the two-factor uh, emotional theory. And what that is, is the two-factor theory of emotion plays with the idea that when an emotion is felt, there is a psychological arousal and the person uses the immediate environment to search for emotional signaling or cues to label the psychological arousal, okay? So you're mentally stimulated by uh, what is around you, not just physically. So according to this theory at its basis level, and I, I know there's several um, there's several advanced theories that stem from this, which I'm not going to get into because, listen, I actually don't want to take this theory and send people into the dark web of the mind, okay? But at its base level, according to this theory, is emotions may be misinterpreted based on the body's psychological state, okay? So it, what you have is, let's, let's talk about the experiment for a minute. So in 1974, the Canadian psychologist, Donald Dutton, he goes out to a place in North Vancouver, British Columbia, over the Capilano River, okay? And he finds this bridge. The background they're trying to figure out is whether the physical arousal is induced by a fear-inducing situation and could be misattributed as romantic attraction. Now, let me say this, that, that psychologists have wrestled with this for years and years. Um, the damsel in distress, okay? So if I was a lit professor, which I'm not, and if I wasn't a preacher, I would want to be a lit professor, but the damsel in distress, what is that actually? Well, what that is, is that's explaining this heightened sense of stimulation that comes from a threat, danger, whatever that it is. And when that happens, the damsel falls into the hero's arms and there is a physical as well as a romantic attraction. So in romance novels, whatnot, movie plots, this always becomes the copy and paste. So what they hypothesize that people who experience psychological arousal like fear might mistakenly attribute those feelings to a romantic or sexual attraction if the context allows. So they designed this experiment where they conduct it on two bridges with two very different characteristics. One is the Capilano Suspension Bridge. What, what do they call this? What's the like street term for this? Like shaky bridge? Yeah, shaky bridge the shaky bridge experiment. Okay, a long, narrow, wobbly suspension bridge that hung 230 feet above the river. Crossing this bridge was an anxiety-inducing experience due to its height and its instability. Okay, so um, what, what you want to think about is how scary this bridge is. Okay, show, show this bridge that Donald Dutton did the experiment on okay so th this thing is like mind-boggling high and and you get any type of a wind to it and it's just it's a heightened sense of risk okay and so what they did is the other one is the control bridge it's a solid bridge it's very low it's a sturdy bridge it was stable it posed no significant risk or fear to those walking across it now, the study involved two groups of male participants who crossed either the high and shaky suspension bridge or the low stable bridge. In both scenarios, as the man, a bunch of men, but one at a time, reached the middle of the bridge, they were approached by a very attractive female interviewer. In some cases, a, a male interviewer was also used to control for gender effects. The interviewer told the men that they were conducting a survey for a psychology project and asked them to fill out a brief questionnaire and talk to them about their experience. The men completed the questionnaire. The interviewer gave them her phone number, 
telling them they could call it later if they had further questions about the study. So here, let's look at the variables, okay? The variables are independent variable is the type of bridge the participant crossed. Uh, scary versus safe or arousing versus non-arousing. The dependent variable was the men's attraction to the interviewer, which was measured by what they said to the interviewer, how they filled out the questionnaire, or whether they called the interviewer afterward and the content of a story they were asked to write. The story was analyzed for sexual content or desire. What were the results? The results were mind-blowing because the participants on the Capilano suspension bridge, they, that was the fear-inducing bridge, heightened level of risk. They were significantly more likely to call the female interviewer later compared to those who crossed the stable bridge. Each one who wrote the stories written by the men on the suspension bridge contained more sexual imagery compared to those from men on the stable bridge. Now, the participants that were on the stable bridge were less likely to contact the interviewer and their stories had almost no romantic insinuation in them or expectation. Dutton concluded that the men on the scary suspension bridge were psychologically aroused by fear. They just increased their heart rate, an increase in adrenaline, etc. but they misinterpreted this heightened state as romantic attraction to the female interviewer. In other words, um, the men attributed their physical arousal from the fear of the bridge to feelings of attraction. The men on the stable bridge, by contrast, were not psychologically aroused. Therefore, they did not experience the same level of attraction. So what is the significance of this study? The significance is that basically it is a classic example of a misattribution. It's a psychological phenomenon where people misinterpret the cause of their psychological and physiological arousal. It has important implications for understanding how emotions and context can influence romantic attraction, fear responses, and decision-making processes. The study also shed light on the role of physical states like fear or excitement in shaping perceptions of others, okay, suggesting that the emotions we feel in a particular situation may not always stem from the true source we think they do. Now, this, this can be extrapolated even into marketing. People do marketing on this, okay? So, it, and it's a fascinating thing, but it goes back to a scientific proof that stolen waters are sweet, meaning that the experience is much more arousing when it is something that is, has a heightened level of risk, okay? And I, I just, I'm gonna ask you a crazy question, okay? And, and the good thing is you can't really answer this because this is me talking and you're listening, okay? But man or woman, I don't care. You, you fill in the blanks, okay? Have you ever looked at somebody, I just did this not long ago, who fell into adultery? And you look at them, you look at their wife, and you look at who they cheated with, and you think, what in the name of God did he see in her? Or vice versa. I've looked at women who have cheated on their husband with someone, and you're like, man, what, what would make you throw away all that you have, lead your family into disarray, divorce, you know, whatever the complicating factors are and extenuating circumstances. But you look at it and you're like, what in the world? I just did this like two weeks ago. I looked at a man who, who fell into adultery and I'm looking at his family and I'm looking at what he did and I'm thinking, it doesn't make sense to me because I'm judging it on a straight physical or physiological understanding. I'm not seeing the the equation as it is presented in a heightened sense of romance life and he basically said 
in, in something that he wrote. He said, I, it wasn't that there was a sexual attraction in that the person that I had an affair with was so much more um, pleasing to me than what my wife was. It was, it was new. It was a heightened sense of going to dinner and will we get caught? And will, if someone sees us, and then it was a heightened sense of, of the sneaking to another city together and getting a room for two or three nights. It was, it was this whole second family, second life thing. And he said, that was part of the stimulant. That was part of what the attraction was. And I sat back and I thought about this and I said, the Bible is always right. Stolen waters are sweet and the bread eaten in secret is more deceitful, but more tasty. So you see this, um, it, it, is the bread really more pleasant? No, it's just the, the, the heightened sense of we've got to sneak to do this. So you have young people. Let's, let's talk about the act of fornication. Okay. And young people that commit this act oftentimes are unable to differentiate between the forbidden, the illicit, the illegality of what they're doing. And they mistake this for part of the heightened sense of emotional attachment they have. And so they say, well, I do love this person and I do want to be, is it, or is it just the absolute heightened sense of risk? What if we get caught? The, the, the part of sneaking off or sneaking away. So what you got to realize is that when you break this down and extrapolate from this, there could be a deep meaning that you might just be aroused to the illegality of it, the forbiddenness of it. Uh, I'm going to read you the NASB's version of Romans chapter 7, verse 8. It says, sin... It took advantage of me because there was a commandment against it. It produced in me a lust of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So he literally says that the fact that I can't do it is what took advantage of me. I, I thought about this the other day in dealing with a certain situation with a young person. I really think that sin takes advantage of people. And the way that it does that is it confuses them to think that what they're committing is, is something extrapolated out of love or deep emotional attachment. When the reality of it is they're not that attached. They're attached to a lust of every kind because Sin takes advantage of them because there's a commandment against it, which, and, and this is the, the thing with gender dysphoria. This is the thing with, with uh, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. You copy and paste what it is, okay? Whatever it is, many times it's the fact that it's disallowed that makes it so appetizing. And once it is allowed, one moves on to something different. So I'm asking you to consider, really consider what is going on when I have an, an attraction to something. Is it that I'm truly attracted to it or it is the forbidden fruit and it is the forbiddenness of it? It is the stolen waters that are sweeter. It is the bread that we have to sneak away and eat that seems more pleasant. The Bible is right. And most of the time, what you will recognize is that in this, the Bible says, James 1, 14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. I ask you, if you feel temptations, if you feel the urge to do anything, make sure that you have a way of extrapolating from that what is really worth 
giving up all that I have to jump into this. And so this, this experiment um, that Donald Dutton did, it really does back up Proverbs chapter 8 um, and Proverbs chapter 9, rather, in verse 17 to me. And it proves that Solomon was right. Stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Make sure you're not deceived by sin because sin brings forth death. And so keep your mind sharp. Keep your intellect engaged. And don't let emotions feed into things uh, about what you like or dislike. A lot of times it's a sense of complimentary emotions that make you feel what you feel. Stay true to the Bible. Stay true to the moral compass and ethics that God provides through his word.